We're delighted to host Mayra Rodriguez Castro and Eleni Sicilianos. And we're making those connections across communities and seas. Um, and we're Small Press Traffic. We're a Bay Area poetry organization. And we do readings and talks and collaborations like this one today. And this week, we're going to be launching our brand new website and our publishing project, The Back Room, edited by Claudia LaRocco. So we're really excited to so stay tuned this week for that. And hi, Claudia. Um, Mayra A. Rodriguez Castro is a Colombian writer and translator. She is the editor of Dream of Europe, selected seminars and interviews. 1984 to 1992 out with Kenning Editions. She is a former postdoctoral research fellow at the John F. Kennedy Institute of North American Studies and a recipient of the Ann Waldman Fellowship. She lives in Berlin. Born in California on Walt Whitman's birthday, Eleni Sicilianos is a poet, writer, and a master of mixing genres. She grew up in earshot of the ocean in small coastal towns near Santa Barbara and has since lived in San Francisco, New York, Paris, Athens, Boulder, and Providence. Deeply engaged with eco-poetics, her work takes up urgent concerns of environmental precarity and ancestral lineages. Your Kingdom, which will be out winter 2023, will be her 10th book of poetry, writing alongside two memoir verse image novels. So thank you all for being here. And I'm just gonna read a short introduction about the personal equation. And then I'll turn it over to Myra and Eleni. Okay. In, 19, in 1796, astronomer Neville McAleen fired his companion for miscalculating star transits at the Royal Observatory in London. McAleen, devotee of the stars, wore a suit for his nights of calculations. This ochre dress made from Indian silk was commissioned by the observatory to keep him warm in observation. He wrote about his method of calculating celestial times of appearance. Quote, the difficulty of attaining the desired exactness arises from various causes, sometimes from the great faintness of the object, sometimes from its over brightness a tremor or undulation, undulation owing to a bad state of the air, or the quick motion of the star through the field of the telescope occasioned by the great magnifying power, and sometimes from flying clouds. The position of stars in the celestial sphere has always been determined in relation between one scintillating object and the next. In the case of transit observations, it is not absolute time that reveals a position, but time difference between one observed star and the second, which draws a map. Positional astronomy, to which practical astronomy belongs, is a science of relations between suspended bodies. The observer carried two principal operations to determine the time of a star transit and its coordinates. With his ear, he would follow the beat of a pendulum. His eyes would attend to the passage of the star over three, five, or sometimes seven threads vertically arranged at equal distances in the eyepiece of a telescope. The transit times noted for every wire were then reduced to one value. In other cases, the calculations measured the covering and reappearance of stars, planets, and the sun, eclipses. 
Transit observation, detecting a star as it crosses a meridian was common to observatories at the end of the 18th century. The observations provided figures for noting ascension and declination, which together set coordinates for every star in the hemisphere. In 1823, astronomer Friedrich Bessel grew curious about incongruent transit values reported at the Royal Observatory. Bessel studied the calculations for a conclusion that different observers detect star transits with seconds of variation. He called the discrepancy constant difference. It later bloomed with astronomer John Pond as the personal equation, a derivative meant to adjust perceptual differences. Their deviations have received many names, error of the senses, there's two, reaction time or reflex sight for the span required to gather a thought, a tenth of a second or persisting surprise. The mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss even developed a formula for calculating faults that transverse the eye and ear. He called this distance form of intuition. So now I will turn it over to Myra and Eleni. Thank you so much, Madeline, and thank you so much to Myra. Myra, do you want me to just jump in, or you, what did um, you? Yeah, yes, was, please go go yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to Maera for inviting me to participate and to Sid and Madeline at Small Press Traffic for hosting this. It's such an important organization to me. My first experience at SPT was, I actually don't know where your storefront is or if there's a storefront any longer. Um, we can be illuminated, but yeah, I went to, I used to go to readings in the early 90s, mid 90s, when it was in the mission, and it was super exciting. I saw some of the poets who became really important to me for the first time at SPT. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Um, and I love, I just love uh, this uh, topic that Maida has put together, and how it's made me think about things. And I'm really happy to see all of you here too. I, I actually just watched, um, if you guys know the French filmmaker Jean Pinlevé, who did these strange kind of um, surrealist um, science education films in the 30s, 40s, I guess 30s, 40s, 50s, even into the 60s. And I watched one of his on um, space the other night. And um, this notion, I, there's a moment in the film where the, voiceover and the narrator, which is uh, Jean Penlevé is talking about how um, this very simple thing, when you close, you cover one eye, if you are looking at an object in the distance and you cover one eye and then you put your finger where the object is and then you cover the other eye and look, you'll see that your finger is actually nowhere near uh, covering that object. And I just thought we could actually all try that for a second before we start today. There's something in the room that you can use as your as your sight line. Um, and I'm looking at a tree outside my window. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, and so the further away something is, the more distance there is um, in where our finger is. And of course, it's you know our binocular vision and all of that. But it's also just such a a cool kind of bodily reminder of this notion of the personal equation and the distance between things that are outside of us or or other. And and you know the more distance it distant it feels or is the harder it is to get that, that um, line together. So I just, I just love that as a bodily beginning to this. Um, of course, when I think about the personal equation, I've been thinking for a long time about um, the way that different animals see the same thing. 
Um, and so I thought I'd read, start by reading a poem from the forthcoming book, and then I'll read a couple of quotes here and there, and then I'll read a, a longer passage from that book. So this is, and please, if anyone wants to jump in at any point, please do. Um, maybe Madeline or Sid, you could shout in case I don't see somebody making um, wild gestures in the ethers. So this is called Who Sees in Sound? We came to think we'd thought everything. Then we knew we hadn't, and we didn't, and we wouldn't. For other animals had thought other things, and there was no way of knowing or thinking what these other things were. How a crab cerebrates a hardened, harried escape across sands damp with night and had a grackle recongressed its torn skin and kin, its kind on unvertiginous grasses earthbound. All, uh, all albatrosses deduced aerodynamic efficiency in adjacent air. If you tap two pebbles together, you can tell how deep the cave is. If you were a bat, you'd do it with a tongue click, throat squeeze, staring a rock in the face, and the rock is staring you back. Rocks become you, worn lightly, your rock face, gold and gray. So I also wanted to read just this just came in the mail uh, a few this week. Anyone have it yet? The new weathers. Some of you might already have it. It's pretty exciting. This anthology poetics from the Naropa archive. And I think I see some people in the in the audience who have essays in there themselves. Um, so uh, this gathering of, of various panels and talks at Naropa over the years. And I'm in the middle of reading Peter Warshall, the wonderful Peter Warshall's The Poetics of Natural Light. And many of you um, probably were at some of Peter Warshall's talks and know about him. Some of you may not. He, Peter was a naturalist um, with, a, with a particular um, friendship for poets. He lived for a time with Joanne Kiger and was friend to many poets. Um, and just, he always did these incredible talks um, that just made you see the world in a new way. And um, this one, he's talking about the deep biophilia of color that we came into being with all these other creatures experiencing color together. And, and that, you know, one of the ways that we, that, you know, for example, if you're, um, if you're a hunter and you're looking for a bird, you might see the red feathers against a green um, background of leaves. And just, just this way that color is a deep, deep um, coexisting experience, and yet we all experience it differently. Um, so he's talking here about, about some of that. Nature does something very bizarre. What we see as yellow is the most penetrating of all wavelengths that get through the atmosphere. It's just the right surf to get through all the stickiness of atmosphere. But if you are a bee, you have an eye that is not water. Our eyes like the ocean. It's the same concentration of salt as the sea. A bee's eye is of crystal and it can take the ultraviolet light. Not just when you put on a pair of sunglasses, Oh, sorry, just like when you put on a pair of sunglasses that can filter out ultraviolet light. So a bee will look at that same yellow flower and see what's on the left into the ultraviolet. Immediately, we know that in the aesthetics on earth, humans have a very limited space. We don't really know what it's like to mix ultraviolet and purple together or ultraviolet and yellow on a palette and create a painting. Sometimes we try. For instance, all the bumper stickers have colors with ultraviolet paint on them, but we don't see the color. What we see is the absorption of ultraviolet light. 
which creates a kind of vibrancy. But a bee artist might take ultraviolet and mix it up with a little orange and have some color we don't even understand. On that end of the spectrum, we have to accept our humanness and our limitations in that photon flux. On the other end, animals like rattlesnakes can feel into the infrared. What's interesting is they have to shift from their eye. They shift to another little organ that's right under their nose. When they hunt rabbits, they're not even looking at rabbits. They are feeling the vibration which is, in a way, seeing, feeling the vibration of the infrared, infrared waves coming toward them. So I just love that reminder of how um, we're all in this experience, but experiencing the flux of photons very differently. And I've been reading um, this past week, no, this past month, um, Wilson Harris's Palace of the Peacock, which Imani Jackson, who's in the audience, kind of um, reminded me of a few years ago. And one of his notions was that his writing is quantum writing. And um, you can really feel that in the way he's uh, scenes, colors, uh, emotions unfold in this sort of um, simultaneity. So just thinking about that too. And then maybe I'll read one more passage and um, then we can read just a short poem by, by uh, the poet Maricela Guerrero. So how does that sound? Sound good? Or Mayra, do you wanna jump in? What do you think? Um, no, that, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> yes. Okay, so Mayra asked me to read a little bit from the title poem of this manuscript, Your Kingdom. This is a 50 page poem. We won't be reading the whole thing just now. Um, but I'll read the first, um, I think this passage takes maybe five or six minutes. If you like, let the body feel all its own evolution inside opening flagella and feather and fingers, door by door, a ragged neuron dangling like a participle to hear a bare sound. On the path, find a red eye hole rabbit, fat of the bulbous stalk pecked out to the core, a raptor did that. So you can he, so you can bore back to the salamander you once were straggling under the skin, grope toward the protozoa, snagging on the rise toward placental knowing. Who developed eyes for you agape in ocean waters? The worm that made a kidney-like chamber burrows in, directing your heart leftward in nodal cascade, slow at your hagfish spine. Who will bury your bones, investigate a redwood rain, or tap the garnet of your heartwood bark? Put your flat needles on dry ice to inquire after your tree family, father or mother in the fairy ring next to you, find you, are most closely related to grass, if you are a redwood. Your hexaploid breathing pores gently closing at night. When did you begin your coexistence with flowering plants from which arose the bee before the African honey badger, but after the dark protoplanetary disk of dust grains surrounding the sun become the earth? You had no nouns, did you? Feel the gravitational sorting in the pre-lung graphite as it marked toward tissue, the split in prokaryotes when ether lipids did you no good, but still you learned to unleash energy, breaking, making bonds and how some ancient groping grains in your gut foraging on gases and who knows what phototrophic algae did, karate chopping, water splitting to feed on sunlight and thus 
You can eat an apple after bacon, benefiting from the invention of glucose storage. But the rugged sex life of the hermaphroditic banana slug nipping at its partner's current penis, later it's a vagina, in liquid crystal slime has little to do with you, yet you can watch and wonder at the structure of your own snots and likeness to its plural wetnesses. Now that you have learned to traffic phonemes plus genes in their own bio chassis delivery system, glottal stop in your sit, e, or button made possible by obstructed airflow. When your organs made for eating, breathing began to cry out the tongue and torsion to express your thought. And it was strange how you altered your formant frequencies and I becomes a you around the fire you switch to pure sound in the dark. And I know what you mean. So I'll stop that there. Um, and maybe we could end by reading just the short, I'm, I'm in love with this book right now. I'm teaching it this week. I blurbed it um, by Marisela Guerrero, um, who's a Mexican poet. Um, it's called The Dream of Every Cell. And it's this wonderful um, kind of well, it does all kinds of things. And one of the things it, it does is it draws on um, inspiration from uh, Maricela's, I don't know if she was her biology teacher, botany teacher, um, but so Ms. Ms. Olmedo is kind of the, the, one of the heroes of the poem. And um, it's a poem in which, yeah, it's the dream of every cell basically. So um, a, a shout out to Maricela. I'm gonna read it in Robin Meyer's beautiful translation. And then Mayra has agreed to read the Spanish for us. Okay, so cells. We're saying this because we want to find a language of nitrogen and peat of cells, oxygen and voices that don't speak in coins or aptitudes. Voices, rumors that speak in shelter, that weave nets of together breath. Voices that will join Ms. Olmedo's voice and tell you in cell speak about chance and beauty and shared breath. We recover other people's searches and thread a gauzy blanket that will comfort and protect and dream of wolves and cells that dream in joy and chance. I'd like to know if there will be room for all of us. <laughs> Gracias, Eleni. Células. Contamos esto porque nos queremos encontrar una lengua de humus y nitrógeno. Células. Oxígeno y voces que no hablen en monedas y talentos. Voces, rumores que hablen en cobijo, que tejan redes de respiraciones juntas. Que con la maestra Olmedo les hablen en célula del azar, la belleza y respiración compartida. Recuperamos investigaciones previas para hilar un manto ligero que proteja y alivie. Soñar con lobos y células que sueñan en el azar y la alegría. Quisiera saber si entramos todos. Thank you, Mayra, so beautiful. Um, no, thank you, Eleni. I am so happy to hear that poem again. Um, so, I will start with a poem by May May Bersen Brugge um, titled Scalar. And then I will move from there. You can rise to a level of not knowing that is untouched by entropy. Out of uncertainty, openness, order is maintained. You rise to a realization beyond decay. 
there's a deeper intelligence than that. It radiates like light across a border between quanta and matter, unifying them. Your physical body and your quantum body of probabilities are like two candles on a table. Space between them evenly fills with photons of light. No separation at the particle level. You carry one candle outside and hold it up against the background of stars. Space between the candle and a star fills with waves that bind them. Each star as connected to it as the one inside. Look at your candle, then look at Sirius. Photons from each hit your retina and electrochemically flash. You're another flame or star in the surrounding interconnected field. Yet, what is the structure of this connectedness? The field is your light and not knowing simultaneously, local light. You observe sky's dimensions according to our consensus on entropy. You don't see the unifying factor in all things. You can't perceive the enfoldment of chance and fatigue. Time also unfolds. Your present state may not relate to what is past, but to a more fundamental structure like a pool of widening rings from a stone. This moment cuts through the physical universe now and seems to hold all of space in itself. What happens today may be altered by an event in the future since space contains the ambiguous, foggy regions where a particle may pass on your last day. Awareness creates the duration you experience. If you try to divide duration, it's like suddenly passing a gold blade through the flame. You divide space, you think time occupies, not motion itself. Imagine duration as non-referential time, change and freedom from the decay inevitably implied. You observe creative emergence. Growth indicates intelligence of the universe as a whole in space you measure as your heart beating new content, new time. I can't distinguish duration that separates two instants from my memory that connects them. Duration continues what has passed with now. It implies consciousness for which time flows. Brain steps sound energy radiating from stars through optic nerve to pineal gland and arranges these myriad photons into a neurological space time grid. It conveys the influx of light as a field mentality. So thought is a form of organized life. Non-physical variables, my wish, intent, expectance, also create and transcribe energy. Even if mind never operates as slowly as the speed of starlight, your future dwells gracefully in the space of your imagining. A body or galaxy requires continuous energy to maintain like a whirlpool in a fast stream. The spiral flow persists the water constantly moves in and out of it. A standing wave of photons comprises the imminent 
braid of starlight that permeates space. And vice versa, emanations from earth, sun, your nervousness and emotions radiate out. You observe this enigmatic dark energy where every point of space contains intersecting photons from every start, past and present. Zero sum, immense creativity streams through you, gyre of light as intelligence or your intent to observe. This observation is grainy, people, dogs, trees, are mosaics, a crystalline lattice of interacting bits, each besides, countless times per second, whether to leap to the next moment. Light, information, so activated, composes a body in the process of coalescence, outcrop of growing infinite fields. Nurture the belief that your body is infused with deep intelligence of this information whose sole purpose is to sustain you. So it has one more section, but <laughs> I will end there um, with Scalar. And then I was thinking today, um, as I was talking to Madeline and Eleni, thank you both again for being here tonight and Sid also for hosting. Um, I was thinking about Amy Césaire, uh, who wrote or said, or maybe they go together. Poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. In short, scientific knowledge enumerates, measures, classifies, and kills. So I think I'll read, let's see. Um, I'm trying to, <laughs> to move very slowly um, and to think on the spot. I will read a story, the story I was told about how the world began. And then I will close with a poem by Ed Robertson. It was said the world began from water a woman rose from a lagoon with her child in arms. The water was cold, dipped in the middle of a mountain. One day, the water sprung and the woman came from the gurgling. She was dark, slim, with black hair. Herself and the child, they walked through the reef into the land. The son grew to be a man. He married the mother and gave birth to children. The two populated earth, each birth delivering even scores of child. They slept in clearings and dewed across. The woman taught her children to weave, build huts, knead clay, cultivate crops and forge metals. Her husband trained warriors and raised them to conduct. Mother and son returned to the lagoon when earth was populated. Followed by a multitude, the woman dove into the water. The two fused into a serpent who rose again to live on earth. The serpent, mother and son had seven colors, each glimmering as if the animal were bathing under its skin. It, the snake, slept inside a tree. Men hunted for herbs, severing trees one by one. The carcasses regenerated when they slept at night. They assembled armies to dig through the trees, first scraping the crust, then hollowing the insides. And they found her, the snake. Thousands of men, ears pressed, quivers, heard her inside a trunk. The tree fell, and before they could hold her, the insides poured and became the sea. The branches were rivers, and the leaves lagoons. Her skin 
with shores. Her ribs dug or standing grew into stems, into tree canopies and the beds above them. There were feathered twigs, thorns, planes over the water. There were black pebbles and she was the air under a stone. The morning I met her, both hands in the stream, I touched the scales, blue, oval, brushed past the fingers, as if the water were running, bellied down, as if the water had legs, it, the water, was scales entwined. Um, and I will close with, I hope everyone's still awake. I guess it's, um, it's early um, somewhere else. Um, I will end with a poem by Ed Robertson, Many Locations. The instant though is ours, Euclidean point without space taking place as form. If it were location, anything there is not the point, it is position in relation, more to other yet positions, more one. That is everywhere, nowhere until pointed out. We have no point until we have to see, say, where how far, renewed, call me. The call made is also on its way. How point also has to be limited and in limiting challenge. What are you doing? Always in process, point is live. Um, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, um, Eleni. Gracias, Madeline, and thank you, Sid, and everyone who's still here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Myra and Eleni. Um, Myra, I was going to show the image again, and um, we're going to move into open conversation, Q&A. Um, feel free to put something in the chat or just unmute yourself. And I'm just wondering if you'd like to give a little context for the image, Maida, once I pull it up. <laughs> yes. Okay. Perfect. So the image is one of what that uh, Leo Smith's um, scores. And I wish I could say more about that right now, but I'm a little bit breathless in a long day on this side. <laughs> Could you say that part again, Mayra? I couldn't hear you too well. Um, so this image is a score from mm. Wadada Leo Smith. Mm. And I think the title is Yaya. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought of you, Eleni. Well, there's there's many different ones and um, made from colored pencils. Wadada Leo Smith is a jazz musician, composer, improviser. Um, but yes, some of the scores are made from colored pencils, but this one had pebbles, stones in, in it. And so I thought <laughs> of you. Yeah, I love it. And I don't know if you knew, because yeah, it's been painted, done, made in Ventura, it says at the bottom here, which is um oh 45 minutes from where i grew up <laughs> so there's a shared uh photon animal soundscape for sure so i put the link to the song um in the chat and so feel free to play that or we can play that the end um so please feel free to ask questions, unmute yourself, or you could put it in the chat. And thanks, Claudia, for that. 
I was going to say also looking at this image that in both readings there were references to rocks or stones. So I thought that was also really interesting. I think, uh, Eleni, there was like something about the stone or the rock looking back at you. There was this really interesting sort of perspective in the line in that poem you read. And uh, anyway, looking at this image, I was recalling that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you're you're looking a rock in the face and the rock, rock is staring you back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Eleni, I just wanted to thank you. Um, I or thank you for mentioning the banana slugs, which is my alma mater. <laughs> Santa Cruz, the banana slugs. Oh, I saw, that's actually the ones that I was thinking about. I was watching um, just a little bit north of that. So yeah, yeah. And they're so amazing because they are hermaphroditic. They can just change sexes when they need to. Um, and I was watching them mate, so it was really wild. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. So we have a question from Jonathan Skinner. What happens to the poet's voice and poetics of voice when we communicate through vibration as distinct from vocalization? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that question, Jonathan. I feel like the question might be the answer, or at least, yeah. Um, I've definitely been thinking about, um, I just want to see if I can, can you put, did you put your question in the chat? I can't quite see it for some reason. Yeah, it's in the chat, but. Uh... It, I don't know why it's not showing up for me. I see that you put something in, but I can't see it. Um, yeah. yeah. But I've definitely, I mean, I've been thinking about voice. Well, just sort of, yeah, the polyphonies of voice, right? If we're thinking about, well, the, and, and this is something you've thought about so much yourself, but yeah, the sort of polyphonies of the, of the ecoscape and the way the sort of skin, the audible skin of earth has been made by all these different voices. And, and also thinking a lot about, you know, because of course we're losing a lot of those um, vocal pieces and what happens to, to the soundscape. Somebody just told me that um, there's this, this recent um, study about voice periodicity. This isn't really actually responding to your question at all, but voice periodicity in depleted ecosystems and that animals fill in the space. Like, so, so if um, song sparrows have disappeared, other kinds of sparrows will start talking more. And I'm just, I'm really interested in what that means or, or how, we, how we contemplate that. Um, but yeah, I love that. I, I guess I've been thinking too, I mean, I've been, I love Sappho and thinking about, for a long time I, I thought of Sappho, you know, the, that switch to the lyric poet being the single voice um, or some kind of gathered eye. And, and uh, my friend Phoebe Yenisi, a wonderful Greek poet, um, corrected me recently. I mean, I, of course we know she had a chorus, right? So, and so, but actually that eye is also multivocal. So just thinking about um, different possibilities of the multivocal in one voice too. Hmm, I love that. I love the um, that notion of an expansive prosody. Yeah, I've been also, yeah, just thinking about, like, we don't really know how, say, Sappho read her poems. I mean, I guess we have a sense of the prosody, but we don't know if they were chanted, sung, spoken, or, or in between those possibilities. And I'm really interested in, in what that might mean in relation to other kinds of polyphonies. Thanks, Delaney. <laughs> it's great to hear, hear your thoughts. Um, Eleni, I'm looking to hear Myra, Myra's thoughts, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the B eye, the liquid eye. Um, and 
I haven't really, I haven't gathered a question, but maybe. Um, for other forms of observation, I don't, I don't quite believe that we can speak for the, for the rock or that we can um, leave our subjectivities, but can we learn other forms or how? Um, yeah, and I, it's something about, I mean, the, the image of a liquid eye, it's just beautiful. So I'll just, I'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a way, it's sort of what Mimi's getting at too, right? It seems like in her, um, that space between the candle on the table and the candle outside. Um, and looking at the, I love that image of looking at the, at the sky with the candle flame outside um, and then the photons talking back and forth between the flame and, and the stars. And um, yeah, I don't think we can. I think, I mean, actually there's this great essay um, that I know some of you know, but what is it like to be a bat, which is kind of about how do we imagine that, that other <laughs> animal space, um, the more than human animal space. And yeah, it's not really possible, but I think part of the, I, I mean, I think we're finally in a moment where we realize that um, the anthropomorphic is not a bad thing, but that's part of what allows empathy and that like leaping into the imagination of that allows us to, to try to see um yeah yeah but imagine yeah <laughs> maybe we should all go around pretending we have crystal instead of water eyes today <laughs> uh and then another one attention attention and the mm. long poem mm. and your kingdom the mm. long poem is um attention and writing yeah I mean, writing a long poem is a is a practical challenge and attention. I find. Yeah. What uh, What kind of challenge was that, Myra? Um, of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I remember I when I at one point realized when I kept saying, "Oh yeah, I have this new poem," and it was like four years, four years new. Um, and I think my, my um, I mean, there are exceptions, but my average time zone duration, um, to come back to May May's poem again, is about seven years, um, seven to eight years. And then that's interesting to think about the cellular turnover rate too, which is about that as well. Um, I don't know, I, I think, I don't know why that is, but I keep having to come back and caress <laughs> works again and again. I, I mean, I'm now trying to come back to in a, with some notion of, I don't know if finishing is the right word, but ending a relationship with something I've been trying to work on for 25 years. Um, and yeah, I think that that attention to, to a long project is about a kind of care. Um, and I mean, I often think of it as, as kind of like moving your hands again and again over the wood of it and, and smoothing it, um, feeling, feeling what the forms are. Um, I don't know. Yeah, are you, are, you, are you thinking of attacking such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I started, I started writing a long poem and then I realized that anything I attempt after that is much easier. So it's mm -hmm. a great um, <laughs> yeah. thing um, more attainable. But I was talking to a fiction writer and I wish I could remember the name who was telling me that colors are characters. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking of, well, colors is environmental alignment of, um, it's, it's a very fragile material. So it might be that a character will only exist in 12 years from now. It's atmospheric, it's chemical. Um, and what it is to wait uh, and to caress and, and to wait. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think it might be, there's something also about sort of letting the poems be in the flux of time of all poetry or, or whatever the, the work is or the project, so to speak. Um, or even like Anne's hundred year po project with the Naropa or, um, and, and I think, I guess, yeah, there's part of the, the, um, the crux of like, then you get to, you want to finish something, right? Or, or the, the, the sort of, you know, American Western productivity uh, question, but let it, if like, if we could let the poems just actually just e exist and be revisited, um, I don't know, for as long as they need. On the other hand, yeah, sometimes you gotta divorce those fuckers, man. I have a question about <laughs> that too. Yeah, as a person who also takes a very, very long time to complete a work, um, I find that sometimes when I come back to it many years later or as I continue to work on it, I've changed. Mm -hmm. And so then the relationship to the work changes over time and the longer you let a project go, like the less I feel connected to the person who started it. So mm -hmm. it's like a re reorientation to what that core spirit of that work is to try to get back to it, even if I've changed or my circumstances have changed, um, which I find interesting in that in that long project sort of. Um, yeah, totally. I know that experience well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that happens with long projects is that you kind of get face to face with your own limitations as a thinker, writer, maker, um, and then finding a way to make peace with that. Or I don't know. I don't know if that's even possible, but yeah. I just yeah. want to. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up something and <laughs> that Maida read in the in May May's poem. Um, awareness creates the duration you experience. So as we're, I feel like as we're talking about perspective and changing perspectives, it's like awareness is the the durational ground. And I was just curious if you two wanted to just talk more about. Like I like how we're moving. We were moving into like multi vocality um, as a as an as another facet of like perspective. Um, and this morning, Maida said something to me that it's important to sing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just maybe <laughs> maybe you two want to speak a little bit to the different intonations and voice and this sort of like gathered eye or gathered um, perspective um, or focus. Yeah, I'm thinking quite immediately of Lady Long Soldier and trusting language. Um, and possibly singing or allowing vibration is a different type of communication. Um, not the sentence with noun, verb, subject, but what is spoken and how it's kind of texturally received mm -hmm. in an environment, in, in a present. Um, mm -hmm. well, and and also also, I would say then everything, uh, <laughs> the polyvocality, is the, the, in the resonance, right, of, of opening your mouth also, because mm -hmm. the space is shaping your sound. Mm -hmm. Well, also, Maira, in our, like, you know, uh, base study of Sanskrit, um, and just, like, those formal primal sounds as, like, creating the universe and the sound as a tool to like change the fabric of the universe basically. And I, I feel like that's really where I was really drawn to Sanskrit and um, yeah, my mother and I practiced a little bit at <laughs> the rope. <laughs> yeah. Mayra, didn't you just make a piece also for the, the siren show? It was just, your piece was just described to me. I haven't, I'm gonna go see it actually this coming weekend. Um, it was described to me, yeah, but maybe you could describe it. 
I'm curious what you um I was heard I love to hear, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um so I it was um described because Monica de la Torre and I are supposed to do something in relation to the show. Um, but it was described as kind of hanging chimes outside and each one being tuned to your voice in a different way, but that is then activated by the wind or by movement. Um, and yes, just thinking about the siren as the, actually as a kind of hybrid, a, a human and, you know, and bird type animal, what kind of voice then does the siren make? So it was just kind of thinking about all of that when I was hearing your, the description of your piece. Um, but I think that's, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> that's her, yeah. 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 That's her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also, I haven't seen it and I haven't heard it because I, uh, in person. Um, but maybe this relates to by uh, a certain resonance and having other people hear it and have it return to me as a, as a sound. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a bit of the distrust in language that I'm trying to cultivate in my, in, in general or trust that mm -hmm. as soon as you open your mouth, it will be, um, it will reach a surface and it will speak. Um, and maybe that relates to the piece itself that is, um, being played by the wind, like it's it's inevitable, right? That we make sound. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you're trying to cultivate a trust of language. Did you say? Yeah, I wasn't sure if you said trust or mistrust. <laughs> oh no, trust. I think yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I've I've been um, been trained to mistrust. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, for good reason. I, have, I mean, I mean, not for good reason, for bad reason. But yeah, I mean, it, it's been so. It's just been used to inveigle, lie, deceive, in, in these um, really um, unfathomable ways. Actually, this is a bit of an aside, but what the in poetics of relation? There's the is it. Um, there's that notion of trusting or not trusting the fathomless word. Um, and I, yeah, like the word being its own um, resounding chamber um, of what truth or untruth or, but maybe we can go beyond that. Um. Mm. Um, I'm thinking back to this Amy Césaire quote of, uh of scientific knowledge, measuring, speaking, naming, um, and that being an act of killing or the, the killing by the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what else, yeah, what else can, can it do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Which maybe relates to Jonathan, I think this prosody that you were speaking about. Um, mm -hmm. And also what you were talking about with Lely's work too, um, that, yeah, the work that's actually um, in movement. I mean, I think that so much of our work that we're all doing is in movement rather than trying to name and fix um, as in the scientific mode. Right, but then I think of extinction and even um, I was having this conversation with Nathaniel who translated um, Poetics of uh, <laughs> poetics of relation <laughs> um, and extinction as an actual thread, threat. Mm -hmm. um, and so the need to speak the names. That mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I know. And because actually even just like maybe we what we need to do is name every single thing, every single like, and of course, like not just sparrow, but like every sparrow needs a name. <laughs> um, so, so that there's that relation, that intimate relationship of, of a specific name for every single thing. But that's beautiful because then that's a collective project, right? We, yeah. um, it's, it's impossible to do it on. <laughs> yes. mm. Yeah, yeah. 
to I just wanted to read what was in the chat. Uh, loving this conversation, this is from Melissa. I feel slow, but loved Myra's saying earlier about going slow, thinking of hearing Lady Long Soldier's reading voice, how slowly she reads, there's a trust there. Myra's speaking of trust and its relation to slowness and creation of worlds. The creation story, world making is slow. Vibrational creation is slow. Yeah, and maybe I, I'm thinking too, maybe Myra, you want to say a little bit about the creation, if you want, <laughs> the creation. No, I was just laughing. Um, <laughs> Melissa, thank you. I'm just laughing at world making is slow because tomorrow is Monday and it's a big admin day. And so it is, <laughs> you know, there's, it's slow to create. Mm -hmm. Maybe Myra, would you talk a little bit about the piece that that you haven't seen or heard? Yes. So the piece, um, the title is Senti, which is an Italian word for both hearing and feeling. Um, the the word contains those two synonyms, um, and so. It's, um, it's a chime and it was made in three cities in New York. Uh, the, the, uh, the legs come from Berlin and then the, the chimes themselves, they were made in Colombia. Um, and so I worked with a conductor and with a luthier to tune this instrument to my voice to five different um, scale ranges in my voice or from my voice. Um, and so the, the, the instrument stands outside in this kind of balcony. And I, I mean, I think the standing is sort of a, is, a, is an exercise of trust as well. Um, Yeah, we have, I mean, we have objects inside museums, inside galleries, but there's, the, to me, there's something very, very interesting about standing in the street <laughs> um, constantly. So that is, yeah, that is the piece. I'm excited to meet her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her. yeah. <laughs> mm. Great. Yeah, I was thinking of um, Sikorax uh, from The Tempest and this, this character, this voice that is trapped inside a tree. Um, and I, yes, I would love to talk about it more. And I, uh, <laughs> but it's, we're running late. I want to be mindful of people's attention. Eleni, where, when do I get to hold your book? Oh, well, the pub date is January 10th, but um, I think I get copies in a month or so. Um, I don't know what that, you know, there's always that weird gap between you have the book, but it's not out. Um, so yeah, yeah. Now I, now I wish the book was gonna have a body that made sound. It was, I guess it does. That's the great thing about language, right? That is, this is one thing, exactly what you're talking about. One thing we can trust is that when we look at words, there's a silent sound chiming in the brain. Oh, thank you. You guys are, you guys are so good at this. You know what you're doing. <laughs> you put links in chats. <laughs> Um, maybe we have time for just like a final wrap up note, or if anyone has a last pressing question or comment, um, feel free to say that or put it in the chat. Okay, well, this could be a multi multi-layered 
project that we could continue to talk about. Um, so just really grateful to you, Eleni and Myra and everyone who's here. And thank you all for being here. The multi locations of Zoom um, are many worlds meeting here. And yeah, just want to offer deep gratitude to everyone. <laughs> thank you so much, Madeline and Sid, and, and thank you so much. Maria. Yeah, I feel like next is to talk about, yeah, voices, disembodied sounds, polyvocality, vibrational texts. <laughs> yes, and we have recorded this and it will be up on our YouTube channel. So review, rewatch, and let the vibrations of the conversation carry forth in your in your worlds and steps and thinking uh, and writing and making. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for being here um, and have a great rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.